all that is right and good, it shouldn't, it shouldn't surprise us that he would hate everything that is opposed to his moral character. And yet it does surprise a lot of people, shocks some, dismays others, and completely sears over some that God would be wrathful at all. The definition there that we have from Grudemai did condense it a little bit. God intensely hates all sin. Speaking of God's wrath, the idea of God's wrath. Now, why are so many people against any discussion of God's wrath? Tell me the flip side. Because so of the flip side? intensely focused on God's love only. Because they're intensely focused on God's love? Nobody likes to be reminded of their failings. Right, nobody likes to be reminded of their failings? Right, what else? They don't want to speak to God and send anybody to hell. God wouldn't send anybody to hell. It's a much easier thought to dwell upon than hell itself. And maybe they tend to just automatically associate it with negative or sinful expressions of anger that they've experienced from other people. Right. Something that they've experienced, they say, oh, God, can be like that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a way that they act. Maybe the way they respond in anger to things that are happening to them. That a God, would, God couldn't act like me. Oh, well, you're right. He couldn't. <laughs> he couldn't. Right. So Daniel and the rest of you have brought up some very good reasons why uh, people are against any discussion of God's wrath. Uh, but we have to discuss God's behavior in wrath because if we don't, we're inconsistent with God's attributes. And, and yet, we oftentimes, with this particular attribute, like to fall into the trap, like Daniel said, of thinking that God can... I can't see God acting like I've been treated by my mother or my father or by the system, the man keeping me down. You know, they, they don't want to keep that notion. Yet, really, that's pretty inconsistent when you think about it. Because on the flip side, we just talked about love, and we just discussed how none of us would think that God's love would fall into the state of lust, right? It would never degenerate into that state. But yet we think God's wrath will degenerate down into just anger and hatred and, and just, I'm powerful, so I'm going to do this type thing. We, we associate the one, we say, well, God's love is not like our love. But on the other side, we say, well, God's wrath is like our wrath. Pretty inconsistent when you think about it. So it, it is a, a discussion that people are often hesitant to have, and, and yet at the same time when we come into a discussion of the gospel, and we're talking about God the Father putting God the Son on a cross, it seems pretty hard to explain why that would be. A.W. Pink says, It is sad to find so many professing Christians who appear to regard the wrath of God as something for which they need to make an apology or at least they wish there was no such thing. Mm -hmm. While some would not go so far as to openly admit that they consider it a blemish on the divine character, yet they are far from regarding it with delight. They like not to think about it, and they rarely hear it mentioned without a secret resentment rising up in their hearts against it. Even with those who are more sober in their judgment, not a few seem to imagine that there is a severity about the divine wrath which is too terrifying to form a theme for profitable contemplation. Others harbor the delusion that God's wrath is not consistent with his goodness and so seek to banish it from their thoughts. Do you find yourself this morning in that position? Thinking that, oh, we're going to talk about God's wrath. I really don't like it when people talk about his wrath. That's so unfair to talk about God's wrath. It's so turn you off type conversation. Pink has a great way of just drawing that out, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. To show us that. And I'll have to admit that as I read that, I was like, am I that way? Do I do that? Do I really resent God's wrath? Yeah, something to think about. Well, hopefully this morning through the lesson and through the, the study guide that you have, we can show you how this is a great attribute. This is something that will draw you into worship like very few other things will do. But it takes a high view of God and a low view of man. If you don't have that, 
you're going to struggle with this. Because when you put the two even, that's when you start seeing God's wrath will be like my wrath. And so I don't see how he could do that. That's where you'll lose that ability to compare. So, God's wrath is directly related to, here's our first blank, Deuteronomy verse, chapter 32, Deuteronomy 32, 39 through 41, let me read that for you, Deuteronomy chapter 32, which is 39 through 41. See now that I, I am He, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Indeed, I lift up my hand to heaven and say, As I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on justice, I will render vengeance on my adversaries, and I will repay those who hate me. God's wrath is directly related to His justice. His justice. Now think about this. If God's wrath were put to those people, groups, individuals, who deserve better, then it would be cruel of God. Right? If God's wrath were put to those individuals, nations, peoples, that deserve better, then it would be cruel of God to judge men. But God pays to a man, or recompenses to a man, according to his works. Right? Romans chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Romans chapter 2. I just want to write that down as a cross reference. Yeah. Romans chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. It says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. Now let's talk about wrath, and let's break it down into Old Testament and New Testament. All right? Some Old Testament examples of God's wrath. Can you guys give me some examples of God's wrath in the Old Testament? This is the, this is the uh, mulligan or the gimme shot. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Flood. The flood. The Egyptian plagues. The Egyptian plagues. Book of Judges. The Book of Judges? Yeah. Oh. Rise, fall, oh. rise, rise fall. judgment over and over. Right. <coughs> I told you this was the gimme shot. <laughs> Other examples of God's wrath? Jonah. Jonah. The sons of Korah. Right. Numbers chapter 16. Some others. Let's go back further. How far, how far back can you think of God's wrath being displayed? Adam and Eve. Yeah. Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Throwing down Lucifer. Throwing down Lucifer. Even further back. Wow, that's good. So God's wrath has been in place from before. Right? So it's not a new thing. Yeah. Wasn't a display was it displayed? So some examples. God's wrath drove Adam and Eve from the garden, destroyed the Egyptians, Korah's rebellion. Look at Numbers chapter 9 with me. 
dead person. Whoops. Am I in the right spot? What were you looking at? No, I wasn't. What are you trying to figure out? What are you trying to figure out? Not numbers. You went to Lydic? What are you doing? Lydic. No. Is it native to the Bible? Uh, it's where he's recounting the, Moses is recounting the rebellion. Oh, it's the Deuteronomy. I have this one example for you. Yeah, I think it's probably Deuteronomy. Yeah. Deuteronomy 9. Is that because you're righteous? Is that the Lord your God is giving you? This good land? Yeah. Talk about how he was angry with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Sorry about that. Deuteronomy. I'd have been reading for a long time. Where is it? Just that first. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Go. Deuteronomy chapter 9, starting in verse 6. Know then, it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess, for you are a stubborn people. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you left the land of Egypt until you arrived at this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath, and the Lord was so angry with you that he would have destroyed you. When I went up to the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant which the Lord had made with you, then I remembered on the mountain. There, I, then I remained on the mountain. Excuse me, forty days and nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. The Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written by the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken with you at the mountain from the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. It came about at the end of forty days and nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone. The tablets of the covenant, then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down from here quickly, for your people, at whom you brought out of Egypt, have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made a molten image for themselves. The Lord spoke further to me, saying, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stubborn people. Let me alone, that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. So I turned and came down from the mountain, while the mountain was burning with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I saw that you had indeed sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves a molten calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way which the Lord had commanded you. I took hold of the two tablets and threw them from my hands and smashed them before your eyes. I fell down before the Lord as at the first forty days and nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin which you have committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was wrathful against you in order to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. So just a recounting. I find you weak. Deuteronomy 9, verse 6 through 19. <clears throat> Ram, do that quickly because time is fleeting away. An example of God's wrath burning against the people who deserve God's wrath. And yet he was gracious. Right? So, some Old Testament. That was the easy one. The New Testament. God's wrath is not limited to the Old Testament, as some think. Some would like to just place that uh, God's wrath just place, takes place in the Old Testament. And now we're under the New Testament, so God's not like that anymore. He's all love. Right? But look at the list of verses I have for you there. Starting in John chapter 3, verse 36. Somebody want to read for me John 3, 36? And then we'll move into Romans. Alright, so just because Jesus has come, has God shut off the side of wrath? Oh. I'm done with that. Christ has come. No, he hasn't. <laughs> it still continues to be an attribute of God, and it always will be an attribute of God. So moving into Romans, we have quite a few here to look at. We see right there in the, in the starting of the book, in chapter 1, verse 18, 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We see it there. Just look over to chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. If you're storing up wrath now, as an unbeliever, and then there will be a day of wrath to come. The same chapter, verse 8, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation will be the result of that. And then over in chapter 5, verse 9, start to see a glimpse <clears throat> from Paul of the good news. Romans 5, verse 9. Somebody want to read that one for me? Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Right. So Christian believers are what from the wrath of God? Saved from, saved from the wrath of God. And over in chapter 9, verse 22. where Paul starts his famous discourse on God's eternal plan of redemption, how the Israelites, how Israel and the Gentiles play parts in this unfolding story of redemptive history. <clears throat> Chapter 9, verse 22 says, What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. So God's wrath is uh, not only tied to his justice, but we see in that verse, and we will touch on this mm -hmm. later again, that it's tied to what? Patience. His patience as well. I'm not going to take time to go through all of the rest of those verses. I would encourage you to do that, though, especially because it seems like you'll see in most of those verses as you read through them that you'll move from a wrath that's taking place against sinners now that's being stored up into a wrath that will be displayed into an end times wrath that God will display. And that's an interesting concept to, to follow through. And those verses, just because of the way they laid out, coincidence, right? No. Um, because the way they're laid out, you'll start to see it starts talking about God's wrath it's going to come, and then the performance of that wrath, especially as you move into Revelation. So wrath seems like a negative concept, wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah, it does. You can be honest. It does seem like a negative concept. But the question we must, we must ask ourselves is, what kind of God would not hate sin? What kind of God would not hate sin? Well, one that's not worthy of worship. Sin is worthy of being hated. Pink asks, How could he who is the sum of all excellency look with equal satisfaction upon virtue and vice, wisdom and folly? It would much lessen who God is if he were to look on both of those things. And Well, it would be... One thing it has to go back to is God's holiness. God's holiness. His holiness demands the justice which brings about the wrath. That's right. That's right. His holiness demands that that be punished. He goes on to say, Pink does, the very nature of God makes hell as real a necessity, as imperatively and eternally requisite as heaven is. So hell is a must as much as heaven is. Must be that. Now, we imitate this attribute when we hate sin. We can't have the wrath of God. Now, we, we know there are verses that talk about the anger of man does not, is not the righteousness of God. But we uh, imitate this attribute of God when we hate sin. We hate sin. And as I mentioned earlier, and I've got some verses there for you, we Christians feel no fear of the wrath of God. You can see Ephesians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians 1, and Romans 5, verse 10. <clears throat> And this is what I want to hit on before our time runs out this morning. We should meditate upon this attribute because... I've got four things for you here, and you'll have to write them in. And you can phrase them however you... however makes sense to you. Okay? 
should meditate upon this attribute because the first one. Now listen, listen to this and then summarize it in your own way. Our hearts should be duly impressed by God's detestation of sin. Our hearts should be duly impressed by God's detestation of sin. So phrase that however you want, but, but we're talking about God's view of sin and our view of sin. We should meditate upon it because our hearts should be duly impressed by God's detestation of sin. Here's the reason why we should meditate upon this. What are we likely to do about sin in our lives? How do we treat it? Tribu trivialize it. We trivialize it. We make light of it. We think, oh, that's okay. I messed up that one time. No big deal. In other people's lives, we don't, but in our own, we're very right. That's right. <laughs> The old glass house. <laughs> I got to knock on it. Pitch it. Right? We need to have our hearts duly impressed by this, <clears throat> to meditate upon this, because we are prone to regard sin lightly and to make excuses for it. I have often thought back to my pre conversion experience, hoping that in, in my in my naivety, naivety, nativity, nativity, my nativity. Um, <laughs> I've often thought, though, that you know how things can get lost. You know, names can get shuffled. Um, people can get overlooked when it's time to pick teams or when it's time to get something done. I've often thought. I'm counting on, before I was saved, I'm counting on some kind of technical error to happen when I get to heaven. To where I can go, look over there. Just sneak in. Get in. Or I'm hoping that, you know, yes, you're uh, Craig Huff of Kentucky. Yes, you've been very good. Come on in. <laughs> well, that's not me, but <laughs> okay. You know, I was hoping that. Hoping that something God, God would have some kind of, there would be some kind of glitch when I got there. You knew the truth, though, right? Uh, not at that time, I didn't. What do you mean? That came later. Praise God. Amen. Amen. That each and every yeah, single one of us are going to die and be judged. Never look yourself if there's somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Judge you, that's the judge, though. That's right. That's right. But we shouldn't count upon God making excuses for our sin. Oh, it was his upbringing. He was that way because of his circumstances. You know, he did okay on those other things, so we should let him in. We should just excuse that sin. <clears throat> his mom and dad were this. Oh, oh, oh. He went to that one church, that really good church. So, come on, we're, we'll just let you in because we'll just excuse all of that. God will not do that. Not. So we need to impress upon ourselves the wrath of God because we tend to make light of our sins. The second one. We should meditate upon this attribute because, this is a little change of wording, in order to have our souls a true fear of God. In order to have in our souls a true fear of God. In order to have in our souls a true fear of God. There's a whole thing again. So we should meditate upon this attribute because, and then I've changed the word, in order to have in our souls a true fear of God. Now I do have a cross reference for you on this one. It's Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 28 and 29, which says, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. 
<clears throat> for our God is a consuming fire. And let me just give you, by way of a resource that I would strongly suggest to you to really help you with this, is um, the book Gospel Fear. It's by Jeremiah Burroughs. It's a collection of his sermons. Um, I've used some of his stuff in other teachings and other things that we've done. Gospel Fear. Two words that go together there. You're like, wow, what do I, what do, I do with that? Another resource is another collection of his sermons called Gospel Worship. Talking about how God will be, uh, his name will be sanctified and made holy by those who worship him. Great couple of resources for you to see the wrath of God and our place in it and the joy that we have because of it. So a couple of <coughs> suggestions for you there. So the first one was our hearts should be duly impressed by God's detestation of sin because we're prone to regard sin lightly and make excuses for it. The second was in order to have in our souls a true fear of God. And the third one, it serves to draw out our souls in fervent praise for our deliverance from the wrath to come. It serves to draw out our souls in fervent praise for our deliverance from the wrath to come. And the wrath to come is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And it serves to draw out our souls in fervent praise for our deliverance <clears throat> from the wrath to come. A reference for you there is Psalm chapter 130. Psalm 130, verse 3 and 4. Psalm 130, verse 3 and 4. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. And quickly moving to the last one. The last one, number four, moves out of that. God's wrath should motivate us to evangelize. God's wrath should motivate us to evangelize. And I really want you to take a moment when you get time this afternoon or tomorrow morning in your quiet time to take a look at Romans 3, 25 and 26 and dwell upon the fact that Jesus took that wrath that you deserve on himself. And he took it down to the very last drop. There is nothing left in the cup of wrath for you as a believer. Romans 3, 25 and 26. It's down there on the next part where it says Jesus took the wrath for us. I'm going to finish with a quote. And then I'll give you the last blank there. Pink again. How sorely was Christ's soul exercised with thoughts of God's marking the iniquities of his people when they were upon him. He was amazed and very heavy. His awful agony, his bloody sweat, his strong cries and supplications, his reiterated prayers, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. His last dreadful cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? all manifest what fearful apprehensions he had of what it was for God to mark iniquities. Well may poor sinners cry out, Lord, who shall stand?